We're very thankful to Sharon for the, uh, the invite to be here today. Um, we're going to do, in the, in the spirit of intensive care, a catastrophic case presentation um, entitled How Low Can You Flow? Um, it's not something that you're going to encounter day to day in the cath lab, but it's, um, it's something that if you get to the point of requiring ECMO as a salvage in the cath lab, then you're probably a year too late in terms of putting out the call because the systems development that need to go in place in order to make it successful need to happen in a, in a timely fashion. Um, so I'm going to have a disclaimer here because um, these are non-fictional events, but I'd hasten to add that this is a case that took place in a different hemisphere. So anyone in the room that works at either of our centres can relax for the time being. The patient, um, so the focus here is going from the highly technical to the logistical. So the, the technicalities of, of the uh, percutaneous intervention that she received will be lost on us uh, humble intensivists. We're going to focus on the logistical elements of this case. So it's a 52-year-old lady who presented with a year of exertional chest pain. Turns out she had an ejection fraction of 40% with some anterior wall hypokinesis, which looked consistent with a previous unrecognised infarct. She had morbid obesity and the sequelae thereof, but no respiratory comorbidity and was a non-smoker. This took place in a quaternary referral centre, a high volume ECMO centre doing more than 120 runs of ECMO per year with regional ECMO retrieval as well. So a very highly sophisticated in-house ECMO service, two floors below the cardiac cath lab. Um, this is a weekday elective PCI list. So in terms of the technicalities of the case, this is a lady with, who had uh, radial access to her, to her PCI, noted to have severe LAD and left circumflex stenoses. Um, during the instrumentation of her LAD, she had a VF arrest, proceeded to receive a shockable algorithm uh, with manual CPR, not mechanical CPR, for four cycles with return of circulation um, into a sinus rhythm. Um, and during this procedure, she was intubated by the anaesthetist on the cardiac arrest team, who was a bit wet behind the ears and probably two years into his anaesthetic training. Noted to be persistently hypotensive post-arrest, but at this stage doesn't have any central access for pharmacological hemodynamic support and no dedicated arterial line for continuous hemodynamic monitoring. Decided to push on and a peripheral adrenaline infusion was commenced and because of refractory hypotension, there was a decision to insert via the femoral artery percutaneously an impeller 2.5. And then the PCI continued at pace. So we've got a patient who has potentially refractory cardiogenic shock um, and the decision has been made to escalate from pharmacological support to mechanical circulatory support. So what are the options available to us in this type of patient? So if we're talking about percutaneous mechanical circulatory support, we have both pulsatile and continuous flow devices. So the pulsatile device being the intraaortic balloon pump, which we have a, a, a lot of familiarity with, but obviously there's a complete paucity of evidence to support its use in high-risk PCI. We then, in terms of continuous flow, have axial flow devices and centrifugal flow devices, and that uh, can be divided into intracorporeal and extracorporeal therapies, of which VA ECMO is, is one. In terms of what these devices provide hemodynamically, so if we focus on the three devices that are in use currently in Australasia, we have the balloon pump, the peripheral LVAD, which is the impeller device, a peripherally or percutaneously inserted left ventricular assist device, and then ECMO, uh, veno arterial ECMO. And if we look at the pressure volume loops um, associated with this, you can see that the balloon pump offers some improvement of myocardial stroke work on the basis of a reduction in afterload. The impeller offers a very favourable effect on, uh, on myocardial um, oxygen um, uh, delivery and consumption um, by increasing, reducing significantly the amount of pressure work that the ventricle is doing and hence the myocardial stroke work. And then ECMO has variable effects on loading conditions of the ventricle, potentially increasing afterload, particularly when it's peripherally inserted and you're pressurising the aortic route in a retrograde fashion. I'll draw your attention to the blood flow that you can achieve with these devices. I think the balloon pump is here, they've sort of mentioned about 500 mils to 1,000 mils of potential blood flow. I think that that's probably being quite generous, if I'm honest. 
Um, and actually, for someone who's in an established low cardiac output state with a low cardiac index, the balloon pump is going to give you basically no benefit in terms of restoring end organ perfusion. So, and then with the, in the context of ECMO, you can deliver up to sort of six litres of flow, potentially, depending on the cannula sizes that you're using. So, with the impeller, the device that was available in the institution was a 2.5, which will give you up to 2.5 litres of flow. There are other devices available, and at St Vincent's, we've had encouraging recent experience using the Impeller 5 as a device for offloading the left ventricle in the context of VA ECMO, and also bridging patients from ECMO to recovery. So that's something that I think will be of interest moving forward. But in this context, they use a 2.5, um, and the, 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 the adequacy of flow restoration in this context was probably not enough. So with VA ECMO, it's the only mechanical circulatory support device that's going to give you arterial pressurisation, biventricular support by offloading both ventricles, oxygenation, decarboxylation and thermoregulation, which is relevant in the context of cardiac arrest. If we're thinking about ECMO in the context of the cath lab, you can think about it in terms of prophylaxis and also rescue. So the prophylaxis being identifying high-risk patients um, before the procedure and either setting them up for a rapid cannulation if needed or prophylactically going on to ECMO to, for the peri-procedural support. And that's well described in the literature and something that I think increasingly you will see more of for both EP and also PCI and potentially TAVI as well. But this is the context of rescue ECMO, which is a totally different beast. So, Rescue ECMO is when you're in a, in a situation of low flow or no flow and established cardiac arrest. And this is when there needs to be a complete sort of cultural change in the, the milieu of the cath lab from really trying to re-establish TIMI flow, which you're rightly obsessed with and obviously correlates directly with mortality in the context of cardiogenic shock in STEMI. Um, but there needs to be this sort of realisation in something like this, where there was a technically challenging PCI, that TIMI flow may be become superseded by actually restoring end organ perfusion, because TIMI flow 3 is useless if you have established hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. ECPR is coming, so extracorporeal life support for cardiac arrest is, uh, there's an increasing swell of positive outcomes in, in the intensive care literature. This was a, system, a systematic review published in 2016. And you can see that the propensity matched 30-day um, neurological outcome um, showed a 13% absolute risk um, benefit when compared with just um, the control group. And certainly when you're comparing ECMO and the balloon pump, um, all bets are off really. So back to the case. We, as the ECMO team, two floors down, received the call 55 minutes post the initial arrest when the patient had persistent hypotension, which was being managed by a junior anaesthetist. Um, the technically difficult PCI was ongoing. We've now got three cardiologists around the cath lab table, all pontificating on the technicalities of it, which uh, will elude my uh, expertise. The impeller's in situ, and it's well positioned. The tech is happy with it. But what you can see on the intermittently displayed invasive blood pressure is that the MAP is about 40 and probably has been for an extended period of time. So now the question becomes, is this an appropriate patient in which rescue VA ECMO for refractory cardiogenic shock is indicated? And I'll hand over to Pete. So clearly this is a challenging case and the reason we've chosen to talk about this case is because it brings to the fore a number of issues um, in deploying ECMO um, in a hospital or as a service because it's a, ECMO is a team game um, and for each of us sitting in the, the audience today I want you to think about um, questions that may be more specific to your speciality um, the intensivists, the anaesthetists um, would, you would you put this patient on ECMO would you not put them on ECMO that's relevant to the cardiologists and the surgeons as well for the cardiologists in particular um, when would you have made the call potentially for ECMO on this patient um, and in your institution, if ECMO is available as a mechanical circulatory support um, mechanism, then um, how would you go about um, achieving that? For the surgeons, in addition to the previous questions highlighted, um, is this somebody that uh, you would consider for um, hot CAGs or urgent operative intervention um, on ECMO? Um, and although we're uh, 
potentially approaching a case like this from slightly different angles. I think the one thing we probably can agree on um, is that a, a cardiac arrest in general is chaotic, and certainly cardiac arrest in the cath lab is chaotic by nature. We've got a, a young patient um, who's had ongoing refractory cardiac arrest, and they're high stakes. Um, but it's important not to get distracted by the chaos, because um, the emergency Emerging data from the ECMO um, and resuscitation literature says that in patients um, where ECMO CPR is performed and is appropriate, that the quicker you get them on ECMO, um, the better chance you have of restoring um, a potentially good neurological function. And, and we talk, when we talk about survival to hospital discharge, we mean um, a CPC score of one or two, so uh, essentially independent. Um, the sweet spot is about 40-45 minutes, but um, it is possible um, to achieve a balance and have people on um, ECMO quicker than that in institutions where um, the team's oiled and can train together. What are the issues that we face? Um, well, time dilatation. Um, five minutes in resuscitation um, time frame is 45 minutes in the real world. Um, and there are mu multiple human factors involved, um, from tax task fixation, which we're all guilty of, fixation errors, hierarchy, but we mustn't um, lose sight of what is important to have as a shared mental model for these patients. What's the solution? Well, we think the solution is teamwork um, and simulation, and we've recently um, done some work with the Royal Melbourne Hospital um, in Victoria um, in implementing their eCPR programme, working together as a team, practising, working on drills, um, interdisciplinary um, and dealing with complex, um, potentially challenging uh, patient scenarios as a team, surgeons, the cardiologist, the intensivists, the cath lab uh, personnel. Um, and using simulation we can create potentially um, very realistic scenarios where um, we can create uh, situations such as difficult cannulations and have the surgeons um, uh, able to do rescue cut down procedures. We come up with an algorithm or a guide, which is just a guide we've implemented in, in one institution, but really is, a, is truth or thought um, on how a process can evolve um, and not distracting from the importance of having uh, separation within that process. So the first part of it is um, activating um, the ECMO CPR team, um, whoever that may be in your hospital. Um, when that's uh, happening, standard high quality ALS resuscitation should be continuing as it would do normally in the cath lab with the appropriate team. Um, and then there comes a decision point um, when you're going to call um, or when you're going to decide this patient gets put on mechanical security support and, and which one to use. So we reach a, t a critical time point when we have to make a decision whether or not to proceed with eCPR. Um, and this is often challenging, so we need some guidance um, to help us with that. This has to be thrashed out. Um, uh, in an institutional basis, um, uh, on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis to establish the best results for our patients. Along with simulation, it's important to think about the simple things such as ergonomics, where we stand as a team, how we operate, how we float in and out together. Um, and once we have decided that the patient is going to proceed um, to an ECMO CPR scenario, um, then cannulation becomes the focus. CPR continues but the team then um, refocuses and, and reorganises um, with cannulating and establishing ECMO flow, flow as an importance. So before we just open up um, some questions to the panel and the audience, um, eCPR is an elephant in the room. It's a controversial topic. It's coming. In fact, eCPR is here in many um, large centres around the country and around the world. Um, as Steve mentioned, um, there's the, the question of focusing on um, flow. Um, flow to Timmy flow versus flow to end organ perfusion and ECMO flow. Um, but in considering any of this, the most important thing is ensuring that we've got high quality planning and practice to establish the logistics required.